This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description. Welcome to Close Readings, the latest in a series of LRB podcasts about poets writing in the English language, drawing on the rich archive of essays and reviews and memoirs of poets that have appeared over the years in the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry. I teach English literature at the University of Oxford, and I'm talking to Mark Ford, poet, critic, and professor of English at University College London. And our subject today is the American poet Adrian Rich. Rich died in 2012 and was born in May 1929. And I suppose, Mark, given the kind of poetry that she went on to write, we should begin by saying something about her family background, that dangerous place, the family home, as she called it. Yes, if you uh, read the whole of Rich's oeuvre, both in poetry and prose, you get one of the most searching and perceptive and in some ways um, uneasy making descriptions of the family home as a site of kind of trauma or unhappiness or patriarchal values which deform uh, not only uh, the daughter but also the wife. She's very interested in, in matrilineal relations as well as patrilineal relations and that interest was spurred by a childhood that was, as she described it, split at the root. She was born in Baltimore and her father was a pathologist at John Hopkins and he was of a Jewish immigrant tradition, an Ashkenazi, and he was um, extremely devoted to high culture and secularism as well. So uh, he brought up Rich in the pretty strict way that he had very high standards. He was very demanding of her. He was probably wished she wasn't a girl, (laughs) while her mother was a Protestant from the South, also a, a very talented. She was a promising concert pianist. She gave up her career to bring up um, the two rich daughters. And Rich discovered her Jewishness later in life and wrote about it. But growing up, she didn't think of herself as particularly Jewish, even though you know she was growing up at the time of the Second World War and the Holocaust. Um, so it was this sense of being split, I think, which was the, the sort of dominant feeling that, that a lot was expected of her. And she was divided between a very demanding father uh, and a mother whose ambitions had been sacrificed to the the demands of bringing up daughters and running the home. So the difficulty of her childhood was in a way that she was favoured, wasn't it? It was that that her father regarded her as special and as as part of of this extraordinarily high-achieving cultural phenomenon, which was the rich family, the rich dynasty. It's uh, it's comfortable, isn't it? It's sort of Episcopalian. She gets sent to Radcliffe College, which is a kind of a grand college for, for women at that stage associated with Harvard. She wins fellowships and prizes of all kinds. I mean, she is she absolutely lives up to her father's expectations, doesn't she? Well, yeah, in the historical context, we, we can think of her as one of those extremely high achievers that uh, the 50s nurtured. Um, Sylvia Plath is the obvious other example of somebody extremely driven, extremely ambitious. Plath obviously didn't have a father from from a young age. But uh, uh, Rich described her own uh, father as a control freak. Um, He prowled and pounced over my school papers, she wrote, insisting I use grown-up sources. He criticised my poems for faulty technique. And he made her read um, many 19th century poetry. And this was for good and bad. It made her feel always like she was in some ways failing. But it uh, instilled in her this tremendous love of, or an understanding of, an experience of poetic form. And what's most striking about her early poetry, uh, that collected um, in A Change of World, which came out in 1951, is its formal uh, uh, perfection, really. It it is formally extremely precise and deft and effective. So we should say something about that volume, shouldn't we, which comes into print 1951, so she's still in her early 20s, 
and it comes into print because it's won a prize. Um, it's won a prize for the for, for being the annual volume in the Yale Younger Poets series, which at this stage is being judged each year by Auden. So, I mean, of all the accolades and distinctions that she receives, this is is the biggest, really. Auden selected her out of all the all the poetry of the year for this honour. The kind of praise that he uh, gives to the volume in his preface, however, is um, oddly oddly muted, isn't it? Well, that was characteristic of Auden's prefaces. I've, I've read most of them and they are. They avoid talking about the poetry in the most ingenious of ways. And he had a great strike rate, though, we should say. Um, Joan Murray, one of his earliest choices, I think, is a terrific poet. John Ashbery, W.S. Merwin, Rich herself. So uh, you, you can't fault his taste. Um, but he disliked puffing these poets. Um, but the, the, the terms in which he praised her are almost comically overturned by Rich's later career. He, he described her poems as neatly and modestly dressed. They speak quietly, but do not mumble, respect their elders, but they're not cowed by them, and do not tell fibs. Very typical Auden word, that fibs, isn't it? So that these were poems that were operating within the new critical template. Um, I think it's worth saying that they were elegant, witty, uh, nicely constructed. They mainly rhymed. They're all in metre and that they fulfilled the prescriptions of the of the new critical ideal poem, which was um, propagated by Clint Brooks's understanding poetry uh, and so on. And so Rich uh, mastered the codes of 1950s poetry, I think you can say, in A Change of World. And she, she um, uh, mastered is perhaps the wrong word, but she sort of developed them and used them to express her um, sophistication, her wit, her uh, intelligence, her wide range of reading, her appreciation of Bach, things like that. These were all the kinds of boxes that you needed to tick if you were to, to, to be esteemed a valuable poet in the 50s. And these were all the things that she would rebel so spectacularly against. But looking at her career as a whole and looking back at her kind of grounding or um, apprenticeship in these early poems, you must say that the, 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 the training she had stood her in good stead. She ended up her collected poems runs to well over a thousand pages. Nearly all of the poems there are, are, are well done, even if one they're, they're um, extravagant in their political views or their denunciations of patriarchy. They're, they're always eloquent, in my opinion. Uh, um, so this this training that in the new critical mode actually served Rich well, though she would herself repudiate many of her early poems. Let's um, have an example of this early voice, shall we? Let's look at that poem called Aunt Jennifer's Tigers, which very nicely exemplifies what you're saying about her interest in form and pattern and the sort of craftsmanliness that the new critics approved of. Would you like to read it to us? Aunt Jennifer's Tigers prance across a screen, bright topaz denizens of a world of green. They do not fear the men beneath the tree. They pace in sleek, chivalric certainty. Aunt Jennifer's fingers fluttering through her wool find even the ivory needle hard to pull. The massive weight of uncle's wedding band sits heavily upon Aunt Jennifer's hand. When aunt is dead, her terrified hands will lie, still ringed with ordeals she was mastered by. The tigers in the panel that she made will go on prancing, proud and unafraid. It's, it's a lovely example, isn't it, of what Stephanie Burt calls in in her contribution to the LRB about uh, Rich, um, an elegant, if all too well-adjusted, 1950s establishment style. <laughs> I th and I think that's right. But it's also, it's quite good, isn't it, because it implies that even within this rather sort of muted early earlier idiom, there's still a, a kind of suspicion of the possibility of something tigerish, something like a beast of prey stalking around in, in Rich's imagination. Yes, and I, I think... It, it's very deft in the way in which it plays off the traditional woman, womanly craftspersonship of, of embroidering a screen uh, and yet uses that. It, it's a poem about poetry in some ways. It's a poem about art. And although um, Aunt Jennifer is herself is cowed by her husband and she's weighed down by all the forces of patriarchy, yet the screen which she creates is a quite assertive and powerful image of 
these tigers which go on prancing, proud and unafraid. And in a way, they can be seen in hindsight to anticipate in the way in which Rich herself would um, speak out against all the assumptions and conventions and institutions that mastered such as Aunt Jennifer. So in a way, it's a kind of mise en abeam of her whole career, which is, is why it's so well known and, and kind of popular and much anthologized. What I like about it, though, is the kind of pathos, uh, the balance between the pathos of Aunt Jennifer's life and the deft, rather sophisticated wit with which she appeals to the reader. So the reader is is, is supposed to pity Aunt Jennifer as well as not sort of exactly look down on her, but see that she is inhibited and rather timid and afraid. And I think to that extent, it's a poem that you can tie in with with the persona and voice of Elizabeth Bishop, who's a poet whom Rich met a couple of times. It, it, it uses a Bishopian faux naivety uh, as well to communicate the opposite to the faux naive, something sophisticated and intelligent, so that the reader is not is not it's not hard poetry, and but one's also realizes that we are supposed to experience Aunt Jennifer and pity Aunt Jennifer without taking her too seriously, perhaps. Yeah, she's a sort of a psychological case study, almost it's like a sort of thing you might get in an Auden poem. So perhaps that's part of the appeal for him. She's very good looking back on these early poems. One of the things she said, which I like very much, was that the, crafty, the craftsliness of it, the formalism, she said, was part of the strategy. Like asbestos gloves, it allowed me to handle materials I couldn't pick up barehanded. And I think that does capture, doesn't it, the way that a certain kind of repressiveness is the subject here, which will then explode into becoming a completely uh, openly treated subject in, in her later manner. So that's her sensational debut. She marries in 1953, doesn't she? And the marriage is um, uh, another complication to her sense of identity and especially her sense of Jewishness. Yes. Uh, I mean, she, she married um, Alfred uh, Conrad, who, who was born Alfred Cohen, and he came from a much more observant uh, Jewish family uh, and grew up in Brooklyn. And her secular Jewish father was so outraged that she'd married a into a more orthodox religious family that he boycotted the wedding and, and Rich was going against her family kind of wishes in going ahead with this marriage. Alfred Conrad was an economist a left-wing economist at Harvard. And very soon she found herself the mother of three young boys and living the life of a um, the, the wife of a lecturer in leafy Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there was a sense in which poetry was her only escape from the trials and tribulations, as well as the joys of motherhood. And again, like Plath, we find that she's one of those gifted high achievers who, nevertheless, the 50s didn't say you're so gifted, you don't have to look after your kids and keep the home clean. Uh, the opposite. She had to have this notion of, of excellence, which is so demanding and so impossible to fulfil. But like Plath, she was picked out as a kind of, you know, high achiever. So she won Guggenheim scholarships and she studied uh, in England and then had a time in the Netherlands as well. So she did benefit from all the scholarships available for those who were uh, seen as talented and gifted. And her poetry continued formal through the 50s. Um, and But about 1957, I think it is, she started dating her poems, which I think is an interesting move because it reflects the sense in which she thought of the poet as somehow part of history and that her poems could be read as a transcription of history. So rather than revolving in the timeless world of uh, Aunt Jennifer's tigers on their screen, the idea that these poems were somehow involved in history and that their date, their date stamping would somehow be revealing, I think that continues throughout her life. So she's moving away from the new critical concept of the poem as the timeless artefact into the notion of the poem as somehow engaging with the zeitgeist and the spirit of the times and somehow being a snapshot, to use one of her own phrases, of what's going on. Absolutely. And of course, what is going on by the time you get into the early 60s, at least, is uh, civil rights. She reads James Baldwin, um, The Fire Next Time, and Notes of a Native Son, and so on. So a, so a whole zeitgeist, as, as you say, which is dominated by ideas of liberation, ideas of, of throwing off 
various kinds of, of enslavement and um, entering some kind of new emancipated world. And I suppose we could say that she seeks to emancipate her own poetic voice step by step in, in these first years of the 1960s in, in tune with that wider political spirit. Yeah, the, the volume Snapshots um, of a Daughter-in-Law is the kind of crucial volume which you can see which becoming, to use a contemporary term I don't like, uh, woke, that that it, in that volume in particular, you can see Rich moving beyond the um, elegance and the control of her early work and experimenting. And one of the key catalysts for this was the poetry of Robert Lowell. Her first volume shows very heavily its indebtedness to the, the dominant poets of the era, in particular Robert Frost, uh, Wallace Stevens, W.H. Auden, Tate and Ransom as well, um, uh, in its kind of elegant, formal properties. But Snapshots of a Daughter-in-Law was, the poem itself was written between 1958 and 1960. And the crucial catalyst was, I think, Robert Lowell's Life Studies, which showed how the personal could be political um, and how using your own life or dramatising uh, your own dilemmas or traumas could also be a political act and a way of citing yourself uh, in, in the living political world of the moment rather than attempting to be a poet in the ivory tower. And the title poem is, is a, in a particularly interesting dialogue, it seems to me, with Robert Lowell's uh, Skunk Hour. Maybe we could have a look at that. Yes, why don't you, uh, why don't you read out um, one of the sections that seems to you to speak particularly to that Lowell prototype? Snapshots of a Daughter-in-Law. One. You... Once a bell in Shreveport, with henna-coloured hair, skin like a peach bud, still have your dresses copied from that time, and play a Chopin prelude called by Courteau. Delicious recollections float like perfume through the memory, your mind now mouldering like wedding cake, heavy with useless experience, rich with suspicion, rumour, fantasy, crumbling to pieces under the knife edge of mere fact, in the prime of your life, nervy, glowering, your daughter wipes the teaspoons, grows another way. There's something Lowellian perhaps in that play between the domestic interior, but also an edge of something quite emotionally ferocious going on. Yes, and the Shreveport Bell is like the Nautilus Island Hermit, of Skunk Hour in being somehow symbolic of a etiolated, failed way of life, and the, the 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 persona, the poetic persona, can only fulfil itself by looking another way, by turning away from that example and growing in a different direction. And I think the Bell in Shreveport is a, is a version of her own mother, who was from the south. And Rich fairly bitterly uh, attacked her later in some of her prose works for uh, failing to reject her father's strict upbringing and for somehow failing to resist the patriarchal ideology which her father imposed upon them as a family. So the key, this, this poem shows how the, you know, the, the first step is to diagnose the problem, uh, which is not just the father, it's the mother as well, and to find a way of growing another way. And this uh, daughter-in-law sort of flirts with self-harm. She lets the tap stream scald her arm. She lets a match burn to her thumbnail, or she holds her hand above the kettle's snout, right in the woolly steam. These kind of moments of domestic self-abuse are a kind of characteristic way of of presenting 50s domesticity as kind of stifling, but also being interjected by the, the, the female persona, who then goes on to establish a lineage of female heroines from the past, starting with Baudissier, going up to Simone de Beauvoir, who will be kind of iconic figures for her and will enable this release. And that search for a female genealogy is, is then carried through from, in Rich's work from 63 to the end of her life, that she is always locating herself in relation to these liberating female precursors. It is an interesting transition poem, I think, in a way, snapsh Snapshots of a Daughter-in-Law, isn't it? Because it does have that great sort of psychologically insightful rawness about it that you're talking about, but it's also at the same time a very bookish kind of poem. It quotes, as as we heard you reading out a moment ago, it quotes people talking about Chopin, there's allusions to Baudelaire, there's a tag from Horace a bit later on, a bit from Wollstonecraft. She, she quotes Diderot saying something a bit later on. So it's a kind of a curious mixture, isn't 
isn't it, of of a confrontation with with raw experience that she's learnt from Lowell in some ways, but also there's still a kind of academic kind of feel to a certain aspect of this poem. Yes, and it's worth pointing out that Rich spent most of her life teaching in universities, that she was a, a beneficiary of the willingness of American universities to have poets on campus. And uh, although she got frustrated with it, that was how she earned her living most of her life. Yes, she also quotes Samuel Johnson, not that it is done well, but that it is done at all. He was talking about female preachers there. So there's on one side of the ledger, there's these uh, male patriarch patriarchal types who would constrict her liberty and scoff at women. On the other hand, there's these Mary Wollstonecraft is uh, alluded to, uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, and so on, a a kind of canon of of female writers. And the poem ends with this rather utopian vision of a kind of female uh, saviour or redemptive figure who is figured as uh, poised, still coming, her fine blades making the air wince as if she's a kind of, you know, massive helicopter, female helicopter. But her cargo, no promise then, delivered palpable hours. And that hours is one of the first moments we get a sense of the tribal or communal elements that are going on in Rich's address to to her audience, that she is creating rather deliberately uh, a sense of of uh, a number of followers or the like-minded will be those who will participate in this mess- messianic redemptive search for equality in ways of undoing the evils of modern civilization which um, patriarchy is that is the dominant ideology which has to be undone but the attack on patriarchy sort of shades into an attempt to rescue all those who have been dispossessed or who've got an unfair deal in life from the the system. So there is something importantly kind of communal or collective, even if those communities or collectivities are imaginary or, or visionary or speculative at the moment. At the same time, she's very interested, isn't she, in, in, in this line, as you, as you were saying a moment ago, this line of exemplary women who have a kind of matrilinear, kind of um, trans-historical kind of community. And I wondered if we could look at a couple of poems that, that sort of explore that. Uh, these, these women are, are characterised by by their by their solitariness, really, aren't they? Their their integrity is is um, is signalled by the fact that they are they are standing alone. I'm thinking of um, Emily Dickinson in the great poem "I Am in Danger, Sir," uh, and also perhaps a little bit more uh, unusually uh, as a hero in this kind of tradition or heroine in this kind of tradition, Caroline Herschel, the uh, the astronomer. Um, would you like to say something about either of either of those poems and 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 the kind of the vision of female heroism that they that they each convey. Yes, uh, Dickinson uh, was rediscovered in the 20th century, actually part, partly ironically through the interest of the new critical poets such as Tate and Ransom. It's the 1940s that Dickinson became suddenly seen as a, a, a poet who wasn't to, to be sort of inscribed on Valentine's cards, but a kind of major poet. And then the Thomas Johnson edition in 1955 came out. And she alludes to that in the poem, I Am in Danger, Sir, which is a quotation from a letter to Thomas Wentworth Higginson. The poem goes, half cracked to Higginson, that's how he described her, living afterward famous in garbled versions, your hoard of dazzling scraps, a battlefield, now your old snood, mothballed at Harvard, and you in your variorum monument, equivocal to the end. Who are you, gardening the daylily, wiping the wine glass stems, your thought pulsed on behind, a forehead battered paper thin, you, woman, masculine in single-mindedness, for whom the word was more than a symptom, a condition of being, till the air buzzing with spoiled language, sang in your ears of perjury. And in your half-cracked way you chose silence for entertainment, chose to have it out at last on your own premises. And that's from 1964. Um, Chose to have it out at last on your own premises. It's uh, turning Dickinson into a a figure of um, almost ideal autonomy, isn't it? Yes, Interesting, she describes her as masculine in single-mindedness, because I think Rich's notion of feminism was 
a way of arrogating for women writers all the privileges and confidence of male writers, and that would involve single-mindedness. I think Dickinson is is so equivocal and so difficult to parse into any consistency or coherence that she could only go so far for Rich uh, as an example. But um, to go back to Bishop, Rich had interestingly conflicted views about her and about Bishop's refusal, for instance, to allow her poems to appear in women-only anthologies and her kind of closetedness about her lesbianism. And there's a lot of discussion of whether or not Dickinson was also can be read as a, a, a proto-lesbian poet. And in both cases, Rich is looking to voice what is suppressed or equivocal or understated in, in poets such as Marianne Moore, again, Marianne Moore, Bishop, Dickinson as a kind of female line, which Rich wants to incorporate, but move beyond into a kind of an outspokenness. So a part of her does agree with the, the kind of half-cracked notion that Higginson propounds, but that's because Dickinson was so suppressed by the by her powerlessness as a kind of um, female dependent in mid-19th century Amherst. And we should say, shouldn't we, that the um, contemporary context for, for Rich now is as far away from the leafy world of Dickinson as could be. She moves to New York in 1966, and the air that she's breathing is thoroughly radicalised, isn't it, by things like Vietnam, by the writings of Simone de Beauvoir. Liberation as a general term becomes fine-tuned, particularly in the early 70s, into the idea of women's liberation. And then mixed up with all that is the growing realisation of her own lesbianism. What sort of changes does this whole maelstrom make to her uh, her poetry? Well, the, the poem you mentioned um, earlier about the astronomer Caroline Herschel uh, called Planetarium is probably her most explicit redefinition of her concept of her poethood, of what it was involved to be a poet, that it, it, it wasn't a question of controlling the material so much as being taken over by the material. And that poem ends with a, a rather sort of striking image of the notion of poethood that Rich embraces in the mid-60s and continues to kind of believe in to the rest of her life. I am an instrument in the shape of a woman trying to translate pulsations into images for the relief of the body and the reconstruction of the mind. And I think what's interesting in that formulation is that she is doing it for the relief of everyone else, everyone's body, so to speak, and for the reconstruction of everyone's mind. But it's also a way of staying sane for her, a way of surviving the pressures and the uh, difficulties of this particular moment in history. The 60s, as everyone knows, in America was fantastically fraught and conflicted. And Rich decided, to use Auden's phrase, which side she was on very definitively. And her husband was on the same side as her, but difficulties developed in their marriage, particularly in the late late 60s, which resulted in in a kind of personal tragedy. Her husband uh, committed suicide in 1970. And that was a kind of decisive for Rich in various ways. It was the source of many elegies for Alfred, but it, in some ways, that as a survivor, she was able to go her own way. And while she struggles with guilt, she didn't herself end up a casualty of her domestic tragedy in the way in which Plath or Berryman or Sexton did. It was almost a kind of uh, a, 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 a regular occurrence for 60s American poets to end up killing themselves. So the the volume of 1973 called Diving into the Wreck contains several poems that seem to or evidently do allude to the to the suicide of of her husband and they're interested aren't they in in the relationship between witnessing suffering witnessing pain and your own identity as someone who has survived, who has managed to keep it keep it going somehow. Uh, and Jacqueline Rose, in her piece in the London Review of Books, writes very interestingly about Rich's interest in the psychology of the survivor, who, who has a kind of ambivalence in her own eyes for for having um, not gone down in in the flood, but at the same time being being very close and very fond of uh, people who have. Yes, I think there's obviously a measure of guilt and unease in Rich's poems, which consider 
both her father, who died in 1968, and then her husband, who died in two years later. But what is perhaps most striking about her is her toughness, <laughs> that as a, and her ebullience, that these poems about these people who have led to trauma in her life, the traumas are processed by the poems, and that I mean, the poem From a Survivor, which is in Diving into the Wreck, is a good example. It reflects quite directly on the death of, of Alfred, but it also looks forward to a kind of new life, which she is going to uh, seize with both hands. So I think there's a very delicate balance that, that she manages to draw in such poems between descriptions of the tragedy and a determination uh, not to be taken have her own life taken over by it. And in this one, it's quite interesting that she uses the tactic, a poem from a survivor, she uses the tactic of seeing them as somehow a product of the times. The pact that we made was the ordinary pact of men and women in those days. I.e. in the 50s, you didn't really think about uh, these things that much. You just uh, went with it. I don't know who we thought we were that our personalities could resist the failures of the race. So the, the, the failure of their marriage becomes almost emblematic of the failure of the entire human race or the difficulties it's experiencing uh, in the late 60s. Lucky or unlucky, we didn't know the race had failures of that order and that we were going to share them. Like everybody else, we thought of ourselves as special. Your body is as vivid to me as it ever was, even more since my feeling for it is clearer. I know what it could do and could not do. It is no longer the body of a god or anything with power over my life. Next year, it would have been 20 years and you are wastefully dead, who might have made the leap we talked too late of making, which I live now, not as a leap, but a succession of brief, amazing movements, each one making possible the next. It's good. It doesn't end with a full stop, isn't it? Well, at least in my text, it, there's no full stop at the end of the poem. So there's a great sort of sense of um, of endlessly expanding possibility at the end of the poem, which is the spirit with which the poem ends, I guess. Yes, from the 70s on, uh, Rich's poetry is very light on punctuation. It becomes this kind of open-ended te uh, open text in which all sorts of things can kind of find their place. And like Art Jennifer's Tigers, though, it mixes kind of pity and pathos. You are wastefully dead with a sense of, against the sense of purposefulness that Aunt Jennifer's Tigers, we're pretty sure Rich is not going to end up spending her life embroidering screens, that she's going to move on from that. The poem is demonstrating her abil ability and willingness and desire to move on. And here again, we have this desire to move on. So I, I think if you put her against all the sort of 60s poets, the confessional poets, who Rich liked to keep uh, a distance from, such as Lowell and Berryman and Sexton and Plath and so on. I think what is perhaps most striking is her ability to survive. And she was very, very scathing of Robert Lowell's use of Elizabeth Hardwick's letters in the mm. volume Dolphin. So like Bishop, she was quite keen to be careful about the amount of personal information that her poems disclosed. But if you read poems such as From a Survivor or the long one we might mention later, Sources, which is directly about her father and her husband, there is a deep desire to explore in poetry her experiences, her personal experiences, particularly in relation to the men in her life uh, up until 1970. Like uh, like the Tigers, um, the rawness of the experience is, is very often kind of mitigated in some kind of imaginative way, isn't it, by being cast in terms of a metaphor. I'm thinking particularly of the great poem, Diving into the Wreck, which it would be very easy to read in quite straight biographical terms as a coming to as a coming to terms in some way with the suicide and the disastrous uh, catastrophe of the end of that marriage but it's cast in terms of someone going diving down to a wreck isn't it in this in this interesting extended metaphor which again although the tone of the poem is quite distinct from anything the new critics would like nevertheless the the, the conscious manipulation of a long metaphor over the over the poem is something that Clenth Brooks or someone would have liked very much, I think. 
Don't you agree? Yes, there's a kind of allegorical strand in yeah. in Rich's poetry from the beginning to the end that she makes use of, of allegory, and and you can compare the persona of diving into the wreck to someone like the knight in Child Roland to the Dark Tower mm. came the, the the Browning poem that that this is a kind of doomed quester approaching some kind of chaos or catastrophe uh, on some kind of mad quest, but necessary quest that they have to uh, undertake, and. It also reveals the influence of Wallace Stevens, I think, who who talked about not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself. Um, and Rich's in in Rich's strategy for liberating women from patriarchal myths was this notion that we should get use of the rotted names, to use a, a, a Stevens phrase, and that is the first a, a crucial step in the process of liberation. And diving into the wreck becomes this allegorical descent to the place of trauma, which involves getting rid of all the maps, all the previous ways of depicting or representing life in order to start again from a feminist perspective. So as well as being a poem about trauma and loss, it's a a kind of centrepiece of second wave feminist uh, thinking. And it's meant a lot to many women over the years because of its, its relevance to that particular historical drive. I came to explore the wreck The words are purposes, the words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed, the thing I came for, the wreck, and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself, and not the myth. So that's the point you were picking up from Stephen, the idea of a of an absolutely kind of undiluted confrontation with the toughness of reality rather than the sorts of consolatory stories we tell ourselves about it, which might even include the consolatory stories of political progress that we tell ourselves about it. Yes, in that sense, it is a poem in which she sort of stri- strips away all the protective gear that she is wearing. She goes down, she, she compares herself to a Jacques Cousteau diver uh, and uh, and she is wearing the, the body armour of uh, her flippers and her wetsuit and so on. And she, it's a brilliant description of sinking down through through the waves to this Aboriginal site of of some disaster. And the, 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 the drowned person, the drowned face always staring toward the sun the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. Well, she is a kind of tentative haunter here, trying to deal delicately, gently, uh, as well as effectively with the hand that she's been dealt. This is the place and I am here. But it's interesting as well that she's quite, she's takes goes out of her way to make clear that the, the diver can be a man or a woman, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black, the merman in his armoured body. So what, while the poem, as I said, is, is a kind of anthology piece of second wave feminism, the actual pronouns that she uses make clear that this experience is not gendered, that, uh, uh, that the, the I could be a he or a she. And I think that connects with a, a particularly American concept uh, deriving from Walt Whitman that's part of Rich's vision, that that she is a kind of archetype, that she is writing a song of the self. And this song of the, this, well, many, po- most of her poems uh, appeal to a, a matriarchal tradition. That's done in an exemplary way, that anyone who is suffering can participate in this language. So it is not exclusive. And it, it's striking that in her most famous poem, she is so kind of careful to make it gender neutral. Yes, uh, taking um, personal experiences and showing the ways in which they feel epical. That's the great Whitman trick, isn't it, that she learns so well. And there's a quality in which the the personal becomes not only political, but the personal also becomes epic in its dimensions, isn't it? Because it, it always exemplifies some some larger, some huger, some more sort of symbolic political realm or or political history and in the in the poem series from an old house in america which also appears in the volume diving into the wreck we get that kind of brilliantly modulated whitman-esque voice don't we Yes, that's an, an, another 70s poem. And Rich is returning to the house in Vermont in this particular poem, which she had shared with um, 
her husband and he'd killed himself in Vermont. And it, again, like from a survivor, she's dealing with the repercussions of that. And she's reaching for an Amer- a persona which expands beyond her own situation. So that while on the one hand, she's very conscious of how she was formed by particular social conventions in a growing up in a particular place in a particular time, the victim or the benef- beneficiary of being split at the root, sharing, having Jewish uh, roots, but also coming from a, a mother who belonged to the Protestant South and so on. She looks to expand beyond the givens of her social situation to embrace as much as she can reasonably the, the concept of poetry liberating one from one's own social circumstances, which oddly is what happens in her very first volume, A Change of World. But in section seven of the poem we've been alluding to, she writes, I am an American woman. I turn that over like a leaf pressed in a book. I stop and look up from into the coals of the stove or the black square of the window, foot slogging through the bearing straight, jumping from the arbella to my death, chained to the corpse beside me. I feel my pains begin. I am washed up on this continent, shipped here to be fruitful. My body a hollow ship, bearing sons to the wilderness, sons who ride away on horseback, daughters whose juices drain like mine into the arroyo of stillbirths, massacres, hanged as witches, sold as breeding wenches. My sisters leave me. So she thereby sort of incorporates all the terrible events of American history (laughs) into her own persona. So she is kind of, uh, and this is something, say, Langston Hughes did. Uh, She may have learnt it from Langston Hughes uh, in his early poetry, uh, in which he presents himself as the victim of the traditions of American slavery, that she is making use of this Whitmanian persona, which allows her to be a kind of register for all the terrible things that had happened, the Salem witch trials. Uh, Chained to the corpse beside me is actually a direct reference to the Middle Passage in which Africans who'd been captured were chained to each other. And if one died, well, that corpse still stayed there for the duration of the journey. So it's a poetry that's trying to be as wide-angled and open-ended and to do as much, I would say justice, that's the wrong word, to incorporate as much of the appalling aspects of American history as it can, without ever, I think, quite losing a utopian strand, uh, which you get in, in much more obviously in Whitman, but a sense that these things will get better, that once her audience has been liberated from its uh, mind-forged manacles, to use um, Blake's term, it will inevitably rebel against and reject the systems which have created so much disaster. And it's her faith in that sort of makes one in a way glad that she she died before Donald Trump got into the White House because that was the kind of would have disproved in a way perhaps more dramatically than anything else could that that belief well was on hold for the for the time being yes it should be said i suppose that quite a lot of her later poems do have quite large elements of of the sorts of cultural or political pessimism that you've been talking about, which, as you say, in in many of the middle period poems is intertwined with a kind of political utopianism too, as as a sort of possibility. But the picture of America that emerges, for example, from section seven of From an Old House in America that you've just been reading is almost Whitman on its head, isn't it? Because this is America as a as a series of, of an endless series of avatars of injustice and and unhappiness. Whereas Whitman comes along and even when he sees things that are bad, they are somehow all wrapped up in a great narrative of celebratoriness. Yes, in his poetry anyway, in Democratic Vistas, his prose works, he, he was pretty merciless and scathing about the American scene. But Rich is is sort of positioning herself in the 70s, not only as politically active in resisting things like the Vietnam War and so on, but she also comes out as a lesbian and is quite explicit in, in many of her poems from that period in a way that was was fairly new. Uh, in American poetry. And she published a sequence called 21 Love Poems, celebrating her relationship um, with Michelle Cliff, with whom she remained, whose partner she was from sort of mid-70s to the end of her life. And her explicitness on this is a kind of direct challenge to the idea of censorship or oppression. So she's not only part of the kind of alternative life 
but she's kind of a, a, a queer theorist, both in her prose and explicitly in her poetry, which is finding new ways of, is, is celebrating in explicit terms, lesbian sex, pretty frankly, and pretty effectively, in my opinion. It's a difficult thing to do and, and, and uh, effectively, but particularly some of the 21 love poems seem to me both brave and moving. And I think Rich's uh, apprenticeship, again, serves her well when moving into this difficult terrain, which is, is, has not been explored much before. And she uh, saw herself in that sense as a pioneer, to go, go back to the, 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 that poem celebrating the awfulness or, or describing the awfulness of, of American frontier experience, that she herself was a pioneer uh, on the frontier of political, sexual uh, ideology and battling not just for herself, but for all those to whom her uh, example has meant so much. Yes, I love um, the section thirteen of the of that of that series, which abs- absolutely takes up that metaphor of of pushing into new terrain as a, as a way of of figuring um, implicitly at least a, a, a different kind of politics or a different kind of sexual politics, particularly that is imaginable, even if it hasn't yet been realised. And it's very difficult to um, very difficult to to realise. She's never uh, undeluded about that, is she? We're out in a country that has no language, no laws. We're chasing the raven and the wren through gorges unexplored since dawn. Whatever we do together is pure invention. The maps they gave us were out of date by years. Uh, it's a wonderful, I mean, the tone, tonal, control, tonal control of it seems to me wonderful. There's a, there's a, a kind of narrative kind of temper to it, which uh, which is terrific. Yes, and... and um you'll know as an Auden expert how much it seems to be making use of Auden's love of maps and terrains and territories and crossing borders and frontiers. And I think that's what's so, I find moving about the whole of Rich's kind of poetic career was her resourcefulness, that she was uh, endlessly able to repurpose her reading and her and her life experience to create a, a new set of maps, a new kind of idiom or language that she was uninhibited in that, or she fights against inhibition. And the, while I would probably say that most rich admirers, certainly um, I'm speaking for myself here, like the kind of mid-60s to the mid-70s poetry the best and thinks it's the most exciting, it, it's the kind of breakthrough poetry, to use an Allen Ginsberg term. She's a breakthrough artist in that period. The, 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 the enormous amount of poetry she wrote from 1980 to her death in 2012, you know, some nine or ten volumes, are effective in their way. They're, they don't have the kind of personal pressure often of, of those mid-60s, early 70s poems. You feel that they're not responding as much to the, 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 their, their kind of rhetoric to some extent, it's the quarrel with others rather than the quarrel with herself, to use Yeats's famous formulation. Nevertheless, that quarrel with others can be quite inspiring when one reads about it, carried on in such kind of eloquent terms uh, and such wide-angled terms as well. I mean, you get a sense of that from the, the titles of the books, an atlas of the difficult world, the dream of a common language, dark fields of the republic, your native land, your life, that sense to which, in which, like Whitman, she has committed herself to being a spokesperson for her, the entire nation, as much as possible. And that involves a lot of satire, a lot of denunciation, a lot of resistance, but it also is a way, uh, encodes moments of triumph and a sense of a community, which I think is vital for the experience of the rich poem that you feel that once she's established in the early 80s, the template of her late period, uh, she keeps going with it pretty much through the next three decades. And one participates in it and one knows what one's going to get. But that sense of participation can be uplifting and good for you, (laughs) if that's not too kind of crass a way of putting it. It reminds you of what is valuable in life and reminds you of what should be resisted and the extent to which we are the victims of our assumptions and conventions and that those have to be taken on every day if we are to liberate ourselves in, and hope to engage in, create a more, I'm using this rather kind of crass liberal terms, but a more caring and kind of um, uplifting and meaningful society. <laughs> 
The um, later poem that I would always point people towards is the sequence that you referred to a little bit earlier in our conversation called Sources, which is a return in some ways, isn't it, to that more confessional voice, that more privately scaled voice that that, um, that we were describing a bit earlier. And it returns to the figures of her father and, and her dead husband in, it seems to me, an extremely um, sympathetic and, and movingly honest way. Yeah, it's a wonderful poem, a really wonderful poem that should be better known. And she presents her own struggle in a way, which I find extremely moving and she considers all aspects of her inheritance. The Jews I felt rooted among are those who were turned to smoke. This is the period when she was rediscovering her Jewishness uh, and connecting with the victimhood of uh, her, of the Holocaust and recovering a sense of her connection to her Jewish identity, which she derived from her father and her husband. But the poem's power, I think, comes from the, the, her use in this poem, as in her prose, of being split at the root, that she's divided between her different inheritances. Uh, and that is the context in which she assesses or recreates these terrible historical events, as well as the traumas that she herself suffered. It's a very innovative sequence, isn't it? Because it, 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 it moves between prose poems or little bits of prose and uh, and, and verse in, in various forms. And I think some of the most uh, beautiful things she wrote are in the... Uh, in in the prose poems that, uh, that address her father and her dead husband, a very beautiful section seventeen when she's talking to to her dead husband, uh, referring to him in a in a sort of a, an address and also in the third person, the one who like you ended isolate, who had tried to move in the floating world of the assimilated who know and deny they will always be aliens, who drove to Vermont in a rented car at dawn and shot himself. For so many years I had thought you and he were in opposition. I needed your unlikeness then. Now it's your likeness that stares me in the face. There is something more than food, humour, a turn of phrase, a gesture of the hands. There is something more. I think that's just, I mean, it's exquisitely done, isn't it? And, and, and the way that it's at once, it has a kind of objectivity of judgment, but also an extraordinary remembered intimacy of, you know, personal acquaintance. I think it's, it's just brilliantly done. Yes, and I, I think it has, the objectivity is what, what, what distances itself from some of the more extreme confessional poetry of the 1960s and the, the sense of measuredness. And I think this comes back to the the ways in which Rich presents herself as a survivor in her poems. It's through that objectivity, through the kind of hard graft of surviving that she's able to return to such events. And uh, it is very beautifully put together. But it also ends with a kind of celebration of her own womanliness. So she, mm. while she does deal with the, the two men who she writes about so often, she talks about, here I write the words in their fullness powerful, womanly is the last word of it. So in that sense, it's like snapshots of a daughter-in-law. It ends with this vision of a kind of female redemptive figure. Uh, in this case, it, it's Rich herself. And you do feel that Sources, I, I, I think, is, is, is the most, yes, it's, it's the poem from the, the later Rich, which I would most recommend to those who are unfamiliar with her oeuvre since the 1970s. Well, as you say, it's a it's an enormous oeuvre which goes on for many hundreds of pages, and she was writing to the very end, wasn't she? And one of the last things that she ever wrote, I know, is a is a poem that you like, a poem called End Papers. Yes, I think um, it's it's in three parts. I'll just read the third part um, to end, and I think it can be seen as a riposte to some of the criticism that she did receive for her later volumes, from such as Helen Vendler. I mean, Helen Vendler, we should say was a huge admirer of early Rich and, in fact, wrote a piece in 1973 reviewing Diving Into the Wreck in which she talked about how reading A Change of World, it was like someone writing down her own life. How could somebody be doing this? It was my life that Rich was somehow putting down into words on paper. Um, And she admired much of Rich's poetry up to the 1970s, but she found the later volumes 
programmatic or dogmatic and connected to a, a kind of feminist agenda, which made them close to agitprop. And she wrote a number of pieces in the New York Review of Books, which developed that line on Rich, more in sorrow than in anger. But I think in the current climate, there is much of the later Rich, which is pertinent if you think of its connection to the issues raised in Black Lives Matter and so on, that this is a kind of political poetry, which is strong, uh, unashamed, powerful. And it depends above all on creating a sense of community. And this last poem that she ever finished, End Papers, the end of it does presuppose this notion of a, a community which will read her poetry. It uses the image of invisible ink and the flame which others will bring to the paper will release the words onto the page. So it kind of encodes into its it, its into its being a, a conceit, actually rather new critical conceit of somehow the act of reading being a way in which the words become real and legible. The signature to a life requires the search for a method, rejection of posturing, trust in the witnesses, a vial of invisible ink, a sheet of paper held steady after the end stroke, above a deciphering flame. 2011. This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.